The Australian Financial Review. This time last year, delivery service Milk Run was one of the country's fastest growing startups. Founder and young rich lister Danny Millam bet the professionals living in the city with decent salaries were prepared to pay a bit more for their last minute groceries. The Australian Financial Review's technology reporter, Jessica Sire, was one of those who signed up. It was really handy for the last ingredient for, oh man, we forgot garlic or we forgot soda water or something. And definitely if you had people around and you need another bottle of wine or a six pack or something, Milk Run was really effective at just whipping around some extra booze. As Milk Run went on a marketing rampage to add customers, the business attracted almost $90 million in funding from high profile investors, including Mike Cannon Brooks, Scott Farquhar, and US fund Tiger Global. But earlier this month, the music stopped. Milk Run may have been popular with busy city dwellers, but it wasn't making any money. So full disclosure, I am definitely one of the millennials who will be rather inconvenienced by the closure of Milk Run. My partner and I used it a lot. Jess was disappointed, but not surprised. We were always very aware that venture capital was subsidising this convenience for us. We sat at the kitchen table and tried to figure out how these guys were going to make money for many months. We figured we'd use it for as long as we could. Welcome to The Fin. I'm Lisa Murray. Today, Jess Sire on why Milk Run closed its doors, how its failure marks the end of an era of easy money for startups in Australia, and what that means for aspiring entrepreneurs. It's Thursday, April 27. Jess, earlier this month, Milk Run, which had been the last man standing in terms of Australia's fast delivery services, closed its doors. Tell us how the story broke. So we got a tip early on Tuesday, the 11th of April, and my colleague Mark Stefano and I hit the phones calling as many staff, investors, anyone we could think of that might know what's going on inside Milk Run. And we were definitely getting a lot of pushback from employees saying, we haven't heard anything. Like people have been saying we're going to go broke for ages, but we, we haven't heard anything. But around 10 a.m. Uh, on that Tuesday, Mark got confirmation that, yep, Milk Run was in fact closing. The era of instant food and grocery delivery is in rapid decline tonight with another popular startup shutting down. 400 staff were set to be made redundant. Milk Run will cease trading this Friday, less than two years after launching. Its founder blames the worsening economy for the collapse. And to be clear, Milk Run wasn't going bankrupt. Uh, It hadn't been placed in administration. Rather, it was closing its own doors and had enough cash to make sure that all the staff received a severance package and all suppliers were paid in full. And any money left over would go to the investors. Jess, Milk Run was the brainchild of Danny Millam, a serial entrepreneur. Tell us about his background and what he was doing before setting up his latest business. So Danny Millam has a great eye for the zeitgeist, for a consumer-led business. He's terrific at building brands that really slot into the lifestyles of urban young people. He is from Cronulla originally, spent a lot of time in Byron Bay. He was actually one of the co-founders of Koala, which is a mattress delivery company that deliver mattresses to your place within four hours. Introducing the Koala mattress. But hang on, how did we get here? Danny and Mitch started with a ton of research. And some listeners might remember a lot of these ads were really funny. I actually interviewed Millam at the height of Koala's online success when I was working at Spaceship, which is a a tech startup. But as we we grow, we we reach every Australian four times a month, every month, like every Australian on Facebook. Yeah. Um, And we really hit the seat. Wait, you reach every Australian four times a month? Yeah. Something crazy like that on Facebook. We spend so much money. It's ridiculous. So Koala is significant in Australia because it was kind of a front runner for iterative marketing. Millam had inbuilt this marketing studio and was running ads every day and amending them in real time based on the customer response. Uh, How much money do you spend on Facebook marketing? You don't want to know. Yes, uh, I do. I do a lot. Know. You don't want to know. More what? than a million? Uh, what? More than a million bucks? I'm not going to say. Two million? <laughs> Let's just say it used to be a lot of our budget, now it's not. 
basically the idea was we want to get the brand out there, we want to jumpstart a conversation and if people aren't watching the ads or aren't responding to the wording in ads or, or aren't clicking through and buying our product, we need to change the ads and they would do that really fast. And I think that really built up momentum behind the Koala brand. It, it developed its own voice and that's very much uh, Millen's MO and he brought that to Milk Run as well. So Millam is still a director of Koala and a major shareholder and um, Koala's been threatening to IPO for some time but it hasn't yet. Mm -hmm. Uh, But he left that business after several years and took on what some people would say is one of the hardest parts of logistics which is last mile delivery, getting the product uh, into the hands of consumers in their own home. So he was riding high on the success of Koala and now he needed funding for his new business venture. How did he go about getting that and setting up the business? So Millam starts to brainstorm this idea in 2019. In 2020, he starts to lay out the groundwork for Milk Run, which would be grocery delivery in urban parts of Australia in less than 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. This is an idea that has been tried in places overseas, like in Hong Kong, in Berlin, in London, in New York City. And Millam was like, I might give it a crack here in Australia. Well, we're used to having meals delivered with just a few swipes of the phone, but one kind of delivery is really heating up. Groceries. There's a new app taking off in Sydney and taking on the supermarket giants. And to do that, he needed to create a a network of warehouses or dark stores. In these dark stores, the, the goods were arranged to make for a quick delivery. When an order comes through, we have two minutes to pick and pack it and then eight minutes to deliver it. Using dark stores or hubs in each suburb. So the cereal would be next to the milk or the bread would be next to the butter or whatever it was and the staff could pick and pack things as quickly as they could, get them on an electric bike and get them delivered down the road uh, to the customer. As soon as you place your order in the handy Milk Run app, it gets picked and packed with expert precision and breathtaking speed. Then it's straight to a Milk Run rider to get to your place in minutes. And so he raised a seed round of $11 million and in 2021 he launched Milk Run in Bondi in Sydney's eastern suburbs with a plan to expand to Sydney and more broadly into Melbourne as well. Now, a business like this needs a lot of money and eight months later he closed one of the largest early stage venture capital raises in the country's history. He banked $75 million from VC firms including the US fund Tiger Global Management and local funds Airtree, uh, Scott Farquhar's Skip Capital, and Mike Cannonbrooks's Grok Ventures. So this wasn't an original idea, as you've just said. It was tried in some of the big cities around the world. The other companies overseas and locally who were also trying to make this work, who were they? And how was Milk Run making itself competitive? So grocery service is notoriously difficult to profit from. Uh, There aren't huge margins on grocery goods and people need to be buying a lot of groceries in order to achieve scale. In Australia, Volley, Send and Quico were all other ultra-fast grocery delivery services, but none of them managed to make their businesses viable. They actually all shut up shop last year. Overseas, there were companies like uh, Turkey's Gatia and US-based GoPuff. They pioneered this business model and they did well in densely populated cities and college towns. They also raised hundreds of millions of dollars with their grand plans to take on the big grocers and Amazon as well. And so looking at the pitch decks as I have for some of these companies over time, they were aiming for it to replace the grocery buying habits of people. But in the first instance, they were really targeting, you know, the leftover bits and pieces, which is, oh, if you've forgotten the garlic or if you've just forgotten a bottle of wine, you can just pick it up with us. So let's focus on the business model. Obviously, Millen was able to convince investors as recently as last year when he raised that $75 million that this business had potential, that it could be profitable. But was there a big enough market for these type of services? Like lots of startups do, uh, Milk Run's plan was to do what's known as blitz scaling. And it's what Uber and its kind of competition did about 15 years ago. You might remember when Uber launched or Uber Eats for that matter, they offered their service at low costs. And once they'd captured the majority of the market, they began to up their fees and basically dictate terms. The idea is to just capture as many people as you can, build your product into the daily habits of those people 
and then eke out more margin over time. That's such a good word, blitzscaling. Yeah, it's, it gives you a real sense of using money to acquire customers and then hoping in the future that those customers start to pay you more and more. Now, Milk Run were looking to do that same thing here in Sydney. They had hoped to monopolise the rapid grocery delivery service, first by waiving delivery fees and discounted goods and eventually capturing the markets in places like Sydney and Melbourne and begin dictating terms. And it worked for a time. Uh, Despite the money it was costing the company, uptake was healthy and Milk Run's timing was pretty perfect. During the COVID-19 lockdowns, a time when they needed to capture the market, they effectively had a captive audience. We were all at home and millennials like me were more than happy to just spend some of our disposable income on the convenience of grocery delivery. And also people were quite afraid of going outside. So having things delivered directly to your door without interacting with anybody was a real positive for Milk Run. And so when people were confined to their houses for long periods, they had more money than they usually did. There were also job seeker payments and some younger people were seeing more money entering their bank accounts than they ever had. So it all worked out pretty well for Milk Run, which was trying to claw some of that market. The timing was good for Milk Run, but they also had a very focused marketing campaign. Milam has always been a very effective marketer. He has built the Milk Run brand, which is really friendly. It's kind of irreverent. If you were driving around Sydney or Melbourne, there were billboards everywhere. The branding was really prominent. People were on bikes. You could see that the Milk Run branding was wrapped around Corvettes, around delivery vans. It was just sort of quite in your face in a really friendly, happy way. I think just like Milam did with Koala, he established Milk Run as a voice, a very colloquial, friendly, person next door kind of voice. So the marketing ads were really cool. They were fresh. They were everywhere. But as the lockdowns ended, life moved on and the cost of living and interest rates started rising. And all of a sudden, their target market was struggling to ensure that the the household budget was in check. And of course, when you have this strategy of blitz scaling, uh, that's incredibly expensive. And I think the Sydney Morning Herald actually broke this story that Milk Run was losing around $13 a delivery Mm. in some of its really otherwise really high performing suburbs like in Bondi. And it was costing them $57 every time they acquired new customers. So they were hemorrhaging cash and they were nowhere near profitable. And They were struggling to grow the customer base, as people like myself were saying, oh, it might dip down to Aldi or to Coles instead of using Milk Run. And the economic conditions meant that people were much more protective of whatever money they did have. In this environment, the business was quite clearly unviable. And the venture capitalists that were trying to pick the next big thing were all left high and dry. There had been this big shift in what VC was happy to spend to acquire growth. So Milk Run, a highly visible and ambitious startup, was closing its doors. And as far as venture capital was concerned, that marked the end of an era. Jess, you've just said it's the end of an era and not just for Milk Run, but also for probably last minute grocery deliveries and for the funding by VCs of that vaguely good idea that just might work. Explain how the closure of Milk Run is a line in the sand for VC funding in Australia. So venture capitalists have always taken risks. If you look at the investment scale, at one end you've got government bonds, safe, low yield but but guaranteed returns. And somewhere in the middle, you've got equities, stocks, companies that are generating profits that will return to shareholders in share price appreciation or in a dividend. And right at the other end, you've got venture capital. Investing in startups is a high risk, high gain game. And it's really important for progress in an economy. You're trying to back companies that are inventing things that don't exist. Mm Mm-hmm trying out business models that haven't been successful before or or haven't even been thought of before. So 
some of that risky money is supporting those businesses. And the whole idea is that you'll hit it out the park with one company that might subsidise the losses of several other bets you might have made. It's easy to comprehend this in the context of like Apple or Google or Uber. These are companies that venture capital got behind in their very early stages. They wouldn't have been able to attract, for example, a business loan, but have managed to develop new products, develop entire new markets, entire new business models and return money to investors. And that is the essential model of venture capital. And I mean, it's fair to say that a lot of these companies literally change the way we live and think. So When we look at the venture capital market in Australia, most of the success in VC has come off the back of Canva, which is a design company that comes out of Sydney and has just blown up. These funds had made huge outsized gains and in an environment where interest rates were really low, you wanted to be writing checks. There was money everywhere and it wasn't hard to get and there were lots of people with ideas to build technology companies trying new things. And VCs really needed to deploy their capital. So there was felt like checks were being written for every second Australian with a half decent idea. And Milk Run was in the middle of that environment. Mm -hmm. The idea of if we could nab last minute delivery, if we could make this work, that would be an outside gain that could really boost the portfolio returns of venture capital. That was the thinking of some of the VC funds that ended up backing Milk Run. But at the beginning of last year, interest rates moved and the cost of capital changed and the appetite venture capitalists had for fast growing businesses, for spending money in just to acquire customers kind of doesn't matter how much it costs, that attitude changed. And in that environment, a company like Milk Run, whose business plan really relied on reams and reams and floods of new money they were going to struggle because venture capitalists were going to tighten up their purse strings and that's essentially what ended up happening. So let's talk about Canva. You've just mentioned them and a lot of the money that VC funds had to invest in all these bets in the local market like Milk Run came from their returns on Canva. Tell us a little bit about the success of Canva and how it changed the shape of VC funding in Australia. Canva is one of Australia's most successful technology companies. It's a design platform. You can go on there and design websites and posters and any kind of graphic that exists, invitations, um, web pages, all kinds of things. And they've rolled out a suite of AI-driven tools that enable you to create new images out of nothing. And they've really tapped into the market of e-commerce businesses, internet-first companies that need this whole visual communication language. You can build all of that in Canva. So it was started around 10 years ago by a couple called Mel Perkins and Cliff Obrecht, and they had this idea of taking on Adobe Photoshop. I don't know if anyone's listening used Adobe Photoshop, but it's very difficult to use if you haven't been trained in it. It was sort of a professional designer's tool. And Perkins and Obrecht basically said, look, this doesn't have to be that hard. So we're going to build a suite of tools that allows anybody to do this design work. They came up with the idea in an environment where there was not venture capital money being thrown around. It was actually really hard to get funding. And part of the Canva story is how Mel Perkins and Cliff Obrecht met with hundreds of VCs to try and get funding. And their idea was so novel and the competition in Adobe was so massive that VCs were like, look, good luck to you. So Eventually, they ended up getting a little bit of funding uh, from Blackbird, which is one of Australia's largest VC funds, and some other different venture capital investors, and they got off the ground. I think what is really important to note here is that Mel Perkins had built out a commercialization plan from the get-go. She had this idea for this design platform, and then she built out a product roadmap, and she had an idea of how to generate revenue from the product itself. She had a business model. And the business has grown and made the early investors, Blackbird in particular, an absolute mozza. At its peak, Canva was valued at $55 billion. And on the back of that, more money poured into the funds that Blackbird runs because of that Canva valuation that underpins the value and the strength of the whole Blackbird business. But Jess, that valuation has come under real scrutiny over the past year. And there's been a whole debate in the VC community about the valuation of these private companies. Tell us about that. 
So VC firms made a lot of money when the going was good and now everyone is looking for the next Canva. And you're right, Lisa, there is this big spotlight on valuations. About a year ago, tech stocks in the public markets began to sell off and Franklin Templeton and T. Rowe Price, which are big US-based asset managers, downgraded their stakes in private companies like Canva. And that really spooked the local VC firms because they started to wonder whether they needed to revalue their stakes in Canva. A couple of years ago, we were talking about companies that were raising $90 million at nearly a billion dollar valuations. And we knew on the side that they were only really making about $5 million a year in revenue. So the multiples on these companies were massive and it was reflected in the public markets. Technology stocks were trading at 60 times earnings, which showed that investor appetite for growth was really strong. But as interest rates rose and the cost of capital became more expensive, the idea of just paying and paying for this growth hand over fist, well, that started to change. And it changed first in the public markets, and we saw that big sell-off in technology stocks. And the way that private companies like Canva and other private software companies are valued, you find a comparable on the public market, and then you match it to the private market. And you generally have to start to revalue these private companies in line with the public market just to make sure that investors aren't paying a drastically different price for a business that's essentially earning the same kind of revenue. So you've got this this higher interest rate environment, this uncertainty around valuations and businesses like Milk Run, which were there was a lot of excitement about uh, closing their doors. So what's next for venture capital in Australia? Is every player now madly reviewing their valuations and their investments in businesses like Milk Run? The answer is yes. Venture capitalists don't like to talk about this with us. And even when we're doing capital raise stories and we're talking about successful funding rounds, uh, people don't like to disclose the valuations because they are much lower than what they were a few years ago. And when money is more expensive, VC places fewer bets and they're trying to get a better price for a company than they would have a couple of years ago. When the market was really good, VCs were fighting each other to get in on deals and that was driving the valuation up. Now, people are looking for much more realistic valuations in startups. And so it all comes down to an investment philosophy that felt like it wasn't there for a few years. It's come back down to where is the revenue going to come from? What is the commercialization plan? What is the realistic total addressable market for this particular business? And we're seeing VCs writing fewer checks for companies at lower valuations, and it sort of marks a a real change in the appetite for risky companies, for innovation. VCs are still looking for inventions that have never been seen before. They're still looking for tech companies that can provide products that make life a lot easier or we can do more things with them, but they're just not happy to pay whatever valuation for it anymore. So Jess, what will happen to Danny Millam after the demise of Milk Run? And what does this reckoning that you're talking about in the venture capital world, what does that mean for future innovation in Australia and the funding of entrepreneurship. Milam, he's an ambitious entrepreneur. Even just 10 months ago, he was speaking of wanting to create something that could change the world. In the beginning, when you're an entrepreneur, you kind of, you want to create something special. But once you realise you can actually fundamentally change the world, I think that's the most inspiring thing ever. Milk Run, okay, it's a startup that hasn't worked, but I'm sure he'll pick himself up and try again. I've had my fair share of tough times. I've I've, like you said, I've done nine businesses. A lot of the people don't know any of the other businesses because they didn't make it. And I've burnt through a lot of credit cards at a young age and had a bad credit score, which is now recovering. He hasn't waited until there's literally no dollars in the bank. He's closed the doors, made sure that everyone gets paid, is handling everybody's severance packages with dignity and respect and making sure that suppliers get paid. That said, his business did fail. He's lost his investors millions and millions of dollars and 400 staff have lost their jobs. More broadly, for entrepreneurship in Australia, it can't be a bad thing, in my opinion, to have businesses forced to think of their commercialization plan. It can't be a bad thing to train business owners, founders, CFOs, anybody to manage the dollars carefully and not 
excessively buy growth in the name of enlarging the company to try and hit these valuation targets. So I think entrepreneurship in Australia is in a really good place. There are very well-educated people here with really great ideas, and there is a lot of money still floating around just because you've got to think of a, a, a commercialization plan and make sure that you have a path to profitability or a way that the business will become sustainable to get funding doesn't seem like a horrific idea. It just feels like the end of a particularly frothy market cycle. And now businesses with integrity will be building things and sourcing capital and growing and finding customers in a more sustainable way. So Lisa, We've seen this big reckoning in the venture capital model, but I wouldn't say that it's a death knell for startups, innovation or entrepreneurship in Australia. There's plenty of good ideas out there. And as VCs are happy to tell me time and again, good businesses will always find money. Thanks, Jess. I hope you're managing your big supermarket trips now. But thanks for talking us through that. No problem. Thanks a lot. Here's the other big stories we're covering this week. The head of the $200 billion Future Fund says the Sovereign Wealth Fund is once again open to investing in active equity fund managers. The move comes six years after it switched its entire share market exposure to low-cost index tracking strategies and is a response to changing market conditions in which central bank policies no longer dominate equity market returns. The Future Fund's chief executive, Raphael Arndt, told the Australian Financial Review that investors have always faced a trade-off between paying fees to managers and seeking low-cost alternatives such as passive funds, but there is now a richer universe for active management. And inflation fell to 7% in the March quarter, amid an easing in price pressure for food, goods and housing construction, confirming that the worst of Australia's inflation outbreak is behind it. The figures were a little stronger than market expectations for annual inflation of 6.9%, but consistent with analysis by economists and the RBA that price pressures peaked at the end of last year. The RBA's board will meet next week to decide on interest rates. Thank you for listening to The Fin. I'm Lisa Murray with Jessica Sire reporting today. The Fin is produced by Alex Gao and Lap Fan. Fiona Buffini is the executive producer. Our theme is by Alex Gao. If you like the show and want to hear more, follow us wherever you get your podcasts and consider rating and reviewing us as it helps others find us. For more stories about markets, business and power, subscribe to the Financial Review at afr.com slash subscribe. See you next week. The Australian Financial Review.